On this episode of The Eternities, the author of What Happens in Shakespeare's King Lear, Nick Buchanan. So with my book on Lear, I don't want to um, just name things, as it were, catalogue. I, I want to um, uh, shine a light on the wonder that's there and make it available more to, to more people because Shakespeare wrote for everyone and that's the whole point is that it's been... Um, it's been appropriated by a certain strata of people who like to go to the theatre with much bling and they don't necessarily get what the play's about but it's become this ticket of status and um, elitism a quick word before this episode you can support the Eternities by buying books that are featured uh, in these interviews via the online store that um, orders books from Amazon and a percentage of which will go to podcast and uh, that includes uh, this episode's uh, interviewee uh, Nick Buchanan's book um, What Happens in Shakespeare's King Lear Uh, Nick Buchanan is a friend Uh, he's an accomplished designer and illustrator uh, literature aficionado and uh, a bit of a modern renaissance man in uh, 2013 he published his first book what Happens in Shakespeare's King Lear, in which he combined his graphical skills with his love of uh, the play to produce a, it's an ingeniously presented uh, walk-through commentary um, to King Lear, which is uh, Nick's uh, favourite of all the Shakespeare's plays. Uh, I started the interview by asking Nick um, where and how he first developed his love um, for the works of Shakespeare. Um, it began when I was at uh, U- college uh, doing a degree course. It was Liverpool Polytechnic then. It's now Liverpool John Moores University. And there was a guy there who kept uh, um, talking to me about King Lear, and I'd never read any Shakespeare. We didn't do any in school. In fact, I failed my English literature O-level and my uh, uh, English language O-level and redid them later at night school to get them. Um, but he kept going on about this play. It, we, we'd have lots of different in-depth conversations about all kinds of things. And he kept telling me, you know, you really want to read this. It's a, and I don't know how he knew, it, but it was very important to me. Once I read it, there was a fantastic world of tragic and comedy things mixed together uh, in this very strange language, but almost Lewis Carroll You know, like when the fool is trying to tell the king that he's given away too much to his daughters. He talks about a farmer who, in kindness to his horse, buttered his hay. And there's all these weird, fantastical images throughout the play. But you just jumped right in. You started to read a play, even though you didn't have the the literary background at that point. Were you about 20 years old? Yeah, Yeah, I was about 20 years old. And it's true I didn't have the literary background, except that the house that I grew up in was always full of books, and literature was always important. And I always enjoyed literature. Uh, anyway, but I didn't know how to pass exams really, and and that may sound glib, but that's really what it was about more than ever. And the reason I can say that with confidence is that when we did a play, uh, sorry, when we did a short story by um, John Steinbeck, well, a short novel, The Pearl, it's very fabulistic, and it's about a a, a family um, who have a little baby, and they're very poor, but they're pearl fishermen, and he finds a massive pearl one day. And uh, when he brings it home, it, the, that day of joy coincides with his little baby being stung by a scorpion. And in the story, he knocks the scorpion off his baby and um, they get a doctor out. And when the doctor sees how rich they're going to be, he doesn't cure the baby. He only makes it a little better. So he keep returning to extort. It's horrible. But there's a scene in that where he, when he knocks the scorpion off, it says, and he beat it to a paste. And I, the word paste expanded in my mind. And uh, so I just kept this mantra of paste, of this exoskeletal mush, uh, and just the joy of the right word in the right place um, always caught me in, in literature. So you'd read that in school, that book, and that, that little, that little mm, nugget image. Mm, mm, mm. It's hard. And, and I think I, I'm citing that as proof that I was receptive to literature even though <laughs> I might not have been receptive to school or school might not have been receptive to me at yeah. the time. 
So what were you studying when you uh, met this guy who put you on to King Lear? Yeah, we were, we were actually studying uh, graphic design, and really it was all about visual communication. So there's a lot of semiotics underpinning that in terms of um, all of the um, uh, parts that make up a communication and how they could be broken down and analysed in terms of the semiotics, who says what to whom, in what way, along what channel and to what effect and how changes in each of those can, can modify the meaning so, you know, I'm aware that language is a slippery thing and that there are, you know, there's this kind of um, sea of meanings that we can glean, especially when we get towards poetry and metaphor, um, and of course ambiguity. So, was it love at first sight when you read it? It was. I read it over the, a weekend, and 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 the first thing I did on the Monday was get back to this lovely guy, Brendan Catney, who was a, an Irish student studying graphic design at the same time. And, you know, I, I, I just thanked him for introducing me to this wonderful play. Um, not only was it fantastical and surreal with the fool's language and the playfulness of it, um, but it was also deeply moving about what's important in life and what isn't, and the way that if we're not careful, we can be actors in our own lives and um, never, therefore, find ourselves. Or we could deliberately cheapen our lives just for... Uh, material gain, for example, which is what happens at the beginning. So these are these are deep lessons that you that were there present in the book. Whether you had them already yeah. in your life, I don't know. But you know, obviously, yeah. some resonance. So. Yeah, there's there's resonance there. I mean, uh, the loss of my father was a huge thing when I was ten, mm -hmm. and, and and in Leah there is a loss. Um, I won't say who because, uh, like the film The Titanic, as I say, it might spoil it. But uh, the 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 significant loss is deeply felt. It's it's. Um, I think at that point it, it's um, there's a longing for things to be resolved. Mm -hmm. But I think what's beautiful about Lear is he doesn't Shakespeare doesn't turn the story into a tree tidy. Mm -hmm. And he leaves it like films like Chinatown end, where mm. it, it's it's the tragedy remains, mm. and, and and I think that's I think that's mature because the questions it leaves us to ponder uh, are, are rich. Then, whereas if it's all tidied up and and everything's nice at the mm. end, it, it it really doesn't work. And interestingly enough, Shakespeare borrowed a lot of his stories from the Holland's Head Chronicles. Uh, which are about all sorts of things, you know, Macbeth, and there was a Hamlet, there was a... Shakespeare borrowed these stories from other people, and there was a story of King Lear, it used to be spelled L-E-I-R, and in that particular version, the person at the end lives, and everything is wonderful. So when Shakespeare wrote his one, the audiences were familiar with mm -hmm. the previous version, uh, as very well known, Holland's Head Chronicles was very, very popular, um, even from a, from an auditory point of view, people told these stories. And um, where were they from, the Holland's Head Chronicles? I, I don't I don't know the origin because uh, Holland's Head borrowed some of the stories from you know uh, ballads and folk tales, and they, they come from all sorts of different places. And then there's there's no kind of one source. But I think with Holland's Head, it was the first gathering together of lots of these different stories. Um, they were prose or into one volume. I, I think they were. I think they were all uh, prose, but I'd have to check, yeah. Martin. I, I've only seen parts of those, um, and I haven't delved deeply. I, I, in fact, I've read. I have read the Macbeth one, um, but I can't. It's, it's a bizarre admission, but I honestly can't remember if if it was prose or not. It's a while now, but. Um, the key point is, is that you know everybody going to see King Lear when Shakespeare brought his out, ex did not expect the turn of events at the end, and it was shocking, so shocking that for 150 years it wasn't performed. There was a someone else came along, a guy called Nahum Tate, who wrote a very uh, nice version, a, a new ending that made it all nice for everybody. Um, he was the son of a Puritan or, or Puritans. And uh, if you wanted to see King Lear, you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. You'd have to see Nahum Tate's nice version, you know. <laughs> but the, but Shakespeare's version, you know, <clears throat> blew me away. And there's uh, well, you see, what you're saying there is, you know, that contrasts 
you know, Shakespeare's Lear contrasts with um, what most of us are familiar with from stories in mm. the modern world, or you know, yeah. from Hollywood, or, or you know, popular drama. Yeah, uh, you know, the majority of it, 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 it's escapist, and it takes on a journey, and at the end mm. of it, you know, we are left smiling as we leave the cinema yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the best drama, probably going back to the ancient Greeks, mm. um, it has this other resonance that really is so much more affecting and, yeah. and, and, uh, and enlightening, I suppose. Indeed, indeed. And, and Shakespeare studying at, at the grammar school in, um, in Stratford would have studied Ovid's metamorphoses and a lot of things to do with rhetoric. And um, so he, he'd be familiar with that. And, uh, I just love that he was able to give us something rich. You know, there's 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 an awful lot of examples in literature uh, where the literature is richer because it it leaves the questions open, even if it ends on a very bad note. Because it, it it's almost a provocation to what now needs to be done, and how should we then live? You know, exactly. So, does Shakespeare tend? To, I mean, the, my question is about um, why after all this time he is still so revered I mean mm. is Shakespeare hitting those kind of marks all the time consistently what it, what is it about Shakespeare that that is so continuously continuously revered by our culture what what yeah. what, is, what uh, why? yeah yeah what what is it indeed I mean <coughs> we've got 39 plays. Uh, we've got two major poems, The Rape of Lucrece um, and Venus and Adonis, and we've got the, all of the sonnets. It's a vast, first of all, it's a vast compendium of work, but it is all of a very, very high standard. Um, I, I particularly uh, revere the latest work, the, 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 the tragedies, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, uh, King Lear, um, and when he hits his stride with King Lear, I think something wonderful is happening. In fact, it's only after writing the book about what happens in Shakespeare's King Lear that I came across a quote by uh, Robert Anton Wilson, where he was waxing lyrical about King Lear and about how profound the language is. I think the the thing for me that I, I can't obviously say why historically it's been retained. It's you know such a high position. Um, but I think there's a heightened use of language which is both succinct and profound in which he's able to use metaphors with great uh, adroitness, I think people would say. It's, it's, it, there's facility for metaphor. It's, it, it, again, I think with a metaphor... I, I actually believe metaphors probably are highest achievements as human beings. Uh, and I say that without any sense of glibness about that or levity because I think it's um, to be able to say one thing and mean another it is how can we do that you know how, if we wanted to teach AI how to do that where do we begin how can we make a leap so and Shakespeare's full of that all the <coughs> world's a stage it's pattern recognition isn't it at some other, mm. other level we talked in the past about yeah. different levels of intelligence absolutely yeah. it is it is sort of like a, it's a sudden sort of uh, inspiration or, or you mm. uplifted yeah. to, to some overarching perspective absolutely and within that is some sense of gestalt where you can actually grab a hole that was not available to you with each separate part I liken it to um uh, being moved by a piece of music you know and, and if you isolate each note the, it, there's, the thing that actually spoke to you is no longer available and of course we could discuss the spaces between the notes as well but I think with with um, Shakespeare again and again there are these tremendous uh, metaphors uh, I'm, I'm just working on a book to do with Macbeth at the moment and a great speech at the end when he feels completely futile um, if I just share a bit of that, and then I'll, I'll say, you know, why I think it answers, uh, it ticks all the boxes. Uh, a scene where uh, Macbeth just found out his wife has died, and he's lost everything, and it's been a futile exercise in selfishness, and he's got nowhere, and he realizes he's going to be defeated, and he talks about the futility of of each day, and he says, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death 
and then he like a candle bearer and he says out out brief candle um, you know life's but a poor player you know a, 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 a walking a shadow, shadow. Yeah. That's the only, thank you that, yeah that's the only bit of Shakespeare that I know off by heart is oh, great. Out, out brief shadow life is but a I'll break candle life is but a walking shot or that bit, that bit yeah. absolutely and, and you're right uh, and then he talks about like being you know a, a poor player that struts and yeah. frets his hour upon the stage um, but you're right it but actually that, reminds me or, or yeah. maybe this has been said before of, of, of you know the sort of level of, of, of the language involved uh, it's vice versa actually yeah Rutger Hauer's speech at the end of Blade Runner absolutely reminds me of the, the poor player yeah. yeah and I think that's brilliant as well that um, you know that that heightened use of language that elevates and, yeah. and all these as Rutger Hauer says all these moments will be lost in time like tears and rain meaning his death his, absolutely his experience. absolutely and and so and and in that speech with Shakespeare you've got tomorrow you know and tomorrow then you've got today creeps in this petty patient day today and then you've got and all our yesterdays and it's the scope of all that we can experience as being human and it's not Shakespeare being nihilistic it's Macbeth being nihilistic and regarding it all as a futile as loud thrashing about that signifies nothing um, because because he's he's taken the wrong step he's he's lost his soul in, absolutely. in the experience absolutely. and that's what life has then become for him yeah exactly exactly <clears throat> and so he seems to be able to express again and again the accurate perceptions of, of a whole uh, kaleidoscope of experiences that reflect what it means to be human. Uh, and that's very profound. I mean, uh, there's a, 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 a guy in the States who's written a book that, about Shakespeare called Shakespeare and the Invention of the Human Being. Now, I certainly don't think Shakespeare invented the human being. But I think he, he was a cartographer for an awful lot of that which we are. And uh, Well, there's the question, isn't there? Do, uh, I mean, there's, there's no answer, but you know, do, do we shape art or does art shape us? Mm. But it's, it's a totally reciprocal relationship, isn't it? Yes, I agree. I agree. And there's a beautiful uh, quote in a book by E.F. Schumacher, the guy who did Small is Beautiful, um, where he said that life is about carving your own statue. And, and making it as beautiful as it can be, that we ourselves uh, are shaping ourselves by that which we do as well. We were just talking about um, art and life and how you, you, we'd, we'd springboarded from the question about why is, is he as good as he can, mm. you know, what is Shakespeare's standing, what is it he's done that's kind of given him this worthiness? And I went into metaphor and his use of language oh, and his ability. And, um the book in the States, the invention of the uh, human being, yeah. I've forgotten his name, Bloom, his name is, but Harold Bloom, but that doesn't matter. So, heard that name. Is he very esteemed? I think he's, he's very esteemed in the uh, area of Shakespeare, and he has written some good stuff about Shakespeare, but uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't go along with the notion that Shakespeare invented the human being. But there is an interesting dimension, <clears throat> perhaps we can talk about, about how. Um, the richer our language in any area, whatever that language mm. is, um, it might be that that the more thoughts we might have at our disposal. Yeah, because they're t conceptual tools. Aren't yeah, they? exactly. So that, there's that as well. Um, well, we have <clears throat> so many. Are we recording? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> We have so many <coughs> phrases from Shakespeare mm. that he's he's in a, he's inescapable. I mean, so many sure. people who are unfamiliar absolutely will you know bring up phrases mm. and allusions absolutely. So, but but can you look can can you point to any any bigger uh, influences that maybe people aren't aware of in the culture that you know a great that some you know great. Uh, a great river has sort of flown from some influence. Is there is there anything like that 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 sees really shaped in the culture that you can point to, or is it more the linguistic, conceptual, and sort of stories influence that that is? I think from? yeah, that's a good it's a good it's a good point. Um, I think as well as I I, I wouldn't like I, I may have given false impression if I. Uh, suggested that my um, high regard for him was based solely on his uh, linguistic deftness um, and skill it, it's actually to do with what he's saying as well as how he says it and what he presents 
uh, are these little tableau of of people, each with their own motivations, pushing in different directions, each seeking for something to happen, and it's how they come uh, against one another, uh, and how uh, how things are resolved or, or escalated. Um, and with it's so there's an awful lot really about relationships in there, um, and how we treat one another. And there's, there's also tips for how we should live. I mean, when when Gloucester in in Leah is blind, and uh, you know he what he didn't used to be. I won't say how he becomes blind, and uh, he he's so weary of life and, and, and wants to end it all. And and his son uses um, a, a very economic phrase. He says, "Ripeness is all," and and it's really about the fruit not just plucking itself too soon before its time. It, it, it is a bit of a meditation upon, you know, uh, a, a suicide, a potential suicide. And it's really all about how it, he's urging his father to delay and mature and grow. It's about growing and it's about being where we are and growing all we can in our current situation until the right time when the fruit can fall and is the right time for the fruit to fall. Not that I would ever say anything is the wrong time. Mm. I don't, I'm don't. i not speaking of judgment here. Um, I'm talking just about that there's a concentrated use of metaphor that expands in the mind afterwards and you kind of unpack it and, and, and it, it's full. That puts me in mind to talk about ripeness and doing things at the right time of, of the wisdom of something like Taoism. Yes. I mean... Where where was Shakespeare's philosophical or spiritual currents coming from? Is it you know how much was Christ Christianity a factor, mm. um, or or is he an artistic genius that transcends all those sort of mm. obvious cultural influences of the period, and mm. you know therefore has touchstones with things more. That, that do go beyond that that era and that culture, and such as as I just heard, mm. now, just just great yeah, wisdom that that is abroad in in existence. Mm. I think his awareness and knowledge seems to be incredibly broad, and and he certainly seemed to know of uh, of stories and themes and ideas from faraway places. Um, he may never have left the English, you know, uh, you know, UK at all. Um, and I don't know how far travelled he was. He, he seemed to be aware of of many places in Scotland, whether he went there or not. But in terms of philosophically, it's very hard to say because um, the plays are full of all sorts of um, sides, as it were. I mean, it's um, he in he, his players um, were called the Chamberlain's Men, and they became the King's players when James the First adopted him. And he used to um, certainly pander to royalty in subtle ways. Um, you know, King Lear was written, uh, uh, for example, at the beginning of, of James the First reign and uh, was first played to James the First uh, um, and his court on Boxing Day. And uh, I forget the year, but it was uh, something like sixteen oh six or something like that. And uh, of course, James is wanting a united kingdom because he was, you know, king of Scotland previously and wanted to keep things together. And Leah is is a meditation on what happens when a king divides his kingdom and there's all chaos happens. So he tended to be, we might even say duplicitous, but he was certainly all things to all people. But then again, it was in an age when if you said the wrong thing, you lose your head. And um, there was great turmoil in England at the time to do particularly uh, with Protestantism and Catholicism. Uh, and those um, people were being, you know, um, arrested in the middle of the night and taken away and never seen again for things that they said. Uh, and yet Shakespeare also is quite daring and he does poke, uh, you know, in Lear there's a lot of things where the judiciary and the authority is questioned again and again, you know. Um, oh, I mean authority Leah says you know um, uh, I've seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar and Gloucester says I sir and he says and the creature run from the care and he says yes he said there thou might behold the great image of authority a dog's obeyed in office you know just who's got the biggest stick 
um, and again about fairness and justice. He, you know, put very provocative things in there. But he didn't do it explicitly. He did it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <coughs> he, he did it in ways that he could, uh, but not in ways that would end his career. Yeah, um, he had to avoid something like ag- agitprop kind of drama. Absolutely, which Ab- is probably better for the aesthetic. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and, and really, uh, you know, he, he, the. The kind of spinal column of English literature has its roots somewhere in Shakespeare for us, even though there's stuff before then. The consolidation and the uh, elevation of, of verse and prose, uh, Shakespeare consolidated that. So uh, he, he had less to build on in the sense of, of what was local. But uh, as you've said earlier, you know, Greek tragedy and, and things that he studied at school, he, he studied Latin. Uh, if he went to the local grammar, there's no reason to think he didn't. Um, and he would have studied Latin and, and Greek and, um, and Ovid's Metamorphoses in particular, um, and rhetoric and all kinds of things that they, they studied. Classical there. education. Classical education, indeed. But he didn't go on to university. And I think that helped him because he was more of an everyman than in a narrow bandwidth. And the... Um, the folks who, who argue that he couldn't possibly be Shakespeare really dislike the idea that he didn't go to university and he was a country boy. How dare he become this great playwright, you know? And so you've, you've done a, recently done a half hour video on the authorship of Shakespeare and making your case for it was this guy who was known as Shakespeare and, and that's, that's included in the book as well. Mm. As a yeah. chapter. Um, before we get on to that, um, in terms of how prolific he was, how how does that compare to to other um, playwrights and, and writers in terms of his body of work? I think he's just light years ahead. I mean, the the sheer volume is is phenomenal. And I think had he only written King Lear or Hamlet or Othello or Macbeth, I think we'd still think he was incredible. Um, but to do you know the, so many plays and the sonnets and these epic poems it's a phenomenal achievement but phenomenal but human you believe yeah I think it's human I think it is human I think it's just a very uh, evolved or developed human being uh, with a, a facility that he, he was able to hone I mean I think it probably took its toll on his family life as well you know his wife was back in Stratford and he went to live in London and, and worked that way and he did go back home after writing the last place and, and, and you know I think then I, th- I think there's only about four years then and then he, he died you know he, he must have been you know very driven by his, mm. by his artistic vision and his yeah, I, I think he was, and I think he, he was an actor first of all, so he knew the trade, and he had a great passion for what could be said. I mean, I think going back to the broader questions about the greatness of it, I think another thing there is that uh, Jeanette Winterson once said that fiction is the best way of discussing reality, and and I, I think that's the case too. I mean, in your book, Human Plus, and in, in Philip K. Dick, there's an awful lot of... Uh, philosophical questions that are uh, handled with, with great uh, ease is perhaps the wrong word but in such a way that they're so approachable and you, they, they, they uh, invite exploration mm-hmm. um, and the, I think the same is true with Shakespeare that in the, in the uh, compendium of works uh, it's a great way of discussing reality and, and you know I, like I mentioned before about authority justice very contemporary I mean you know we live in an age of spin and at the beginning of Leah where one daughter is flattering her father to try and get more land the one who's on her said that she won't speak in that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not and I can't think of a more contemporary description of spin um, and about social justice as well and how how um, the full weight of the law is felt upon people um, being means tested for their benefits, but uh, people at the very top, are, and you know, in in Leah, he would say, um, uh, through tattered clothes, small vices do appear, robes and fair gowns hide all, um, plates sin with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks, but armoured in rags, a pygmy straw does pierce it. Very contemporary, in it's, my opinion. It's uh, 
It's that it's the it's the cutting through of appearances, isn't it? It's the uh, mm. you know because not everybody can see like Shakespeare or mm. or you know a, a social critic in today's world. You know, yeah. pe- people get 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 suckered in by you know uh, people in shirts and ties on the news um, or even you know swanning around a boardroom. They yeah. look so respectable, yeah, but you know they go a little deeper and. Uh, Absolutely. Well, look at the bigger picture, and, and uh, it's it's not as uh, respectable and fair as it is. You're dead right. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> uh, I, I think that I mean that, that you, you you mentioned something there at the beginning of what you just said <clears> about uh, cutting through appearances, and um, it's interesting that you say that because um, so many Shakespeare plays are to do on some level with the difference between representation and reality. It's a huge theme in Lear. Um, it's a huge theme in Korzybski. It's a huge theme in NLP. It's a huge theme with Philip K. Dick, absolutely. Um, it's um, it's something that happens again and again about what is the real and what is the artifice. Um, and the, um, as Umberto Eco calls it, the faith in fakes uh, as a position where it takes people... Um, and some people think they can ride it because they see some personal gain, usually in a monetary sense. Um, but of course, the real gains they've lost because they've they, they've they've run the wrong race and won it, as it were. And they feel great because they've won, and then they realise what what they've lost. Um, and and that's a that's a very big theme. I mean, uh, when when Leah realises what's happened with his daughters, he calls it a, a covert and convenient seeming that there was a pretense at something. But the notion of it being covert, I think, and, and that ties into your thing about the kind of the suits, the hollow suits, you know. Um, you know, there's another line in, in Lear where he says, uh, he insults someone who is like that. There's a real toady in um, King Lear called Oswald who is at the beck and call of these horrible uh, sisters. There's two horrible sisters and one who's decent and good. Uh, and this toady, this uh, guy challenges him and says, a tailor made thee, um, because that's all he is. He's just a suit. There's no real human being beyond that. And and I think that's a huge problem today. Yeah, and, and the big question is why? I mean, one of the reasons is reality can be tough. Mm-hmm. Right? So we, we are susceptible to... You know, buying these other realities and narratives, <clears throat> especially yeah. when it comes from, you know, people who are very self-interested in yeah. that kind of ideology being circulated. You know, like yeah. elites and and, and uh, yeah. powerful people and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but it's ironic that uh, back on this question of whether Shakespeare himself mm. was the real deal is. is yeah. The, what what would what would you say is the uh, <clears throat> Other than just, it is possible to be that prolific and that and that fantastic. Mm. Um, what 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 evidence do we have that he was the sole author? <clears throat> Excuse me. I think there's there's a there's a lot of evidences that point in that direction. We couldn't say conclusively, um, but having checked the evidence and and viewed it with an open mind and a healthy scepticism, which I think are good start points. Uh, I, I fall on the side of him actually being Shakespeare, the lad from the country. Um, and there's lots and lots of different things that, that point towards that. Um, uh, by the way, I don't need him to be that. I, I have to make it very clear. I really don't need him to be that. I just find that I think he is that. Um, the first thing is that people point to very humble beginnings as a challenge that, you know, and even Will Self does, even Will Self contemplating whether it was really Christopher Marlowe. Uh, in interviews you can see on YouTube uh, it talks about you know um, uh, Shakespeare's kind of humble background but I you know talk about people who do have humble backgrounds like Jimi Hendrix if you go in Jimi Hendrix's background you won't find anything that will tell you that he will become possibly the world's greatest electric guitarist um, uh, you know born into abject poverty difficult childhood mother died cirrhosis of the liver when he was about four or five, father not really there, Jimmy looking after his younger brother, incredibly difficult, stealing cars, you know, they get a choice to go to prison or to in the army, joins the army, 
it, it would never kill a human being ever so you know gets discharged uh, gets into the guitar you know and becomes the world's greatest guitarist so there's these arguments about uh, two humble beginnings don't make sense you could uh, other arguments I use are the Beatles where you, you just wouldn't know these four lads are going to become that and write all of this music none of them could read a note of music in their life they're not into that uh, and same with Einstein who was known as the dopey one you know by his, his maid um, so you get arguments like that then in terms of evidences um, Shakespeare um, used an awful lot of um, local words that are slang like gek um, to mean a kind of an idiot uh, and wappered which means what we would say knackered today um, and, and they were only uh, used very very locally in that very small area of Warwickshire around Stratford he also names people like Marion Hackett the fat ale wife of Winscott and Winscott was just a few miles north he mentioned that in Merry Wives of Windsor um, and, and there was a Marion Hackett who lived there at that time at the time of the writing of Merry Wives of Windsor and there's other slang words that are local to that uh, and no, everyone in Shakespeare's lifetime there were 14 other writers and critics who wrote of him as the writer of the plays uh, Robert Greene some of them quite angry that this young upstart was writing so well how dare he come into the theatre and write at that level um, the, 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 there's arguments for Shakespeare there's also arguments against him I mean, the latest hot favourite uh, beloved of, of, of many actors is Edward de Vere Edward de Vere died in 1604 before Macbeth was written King Lear um, Pericles uh, Antony and Cleopatra and about six other plays and so if you were to present this as a case they usually say ah well he saved them up for when for after he died to make it look like it and it just gets more and more convoluted and I think again concept can follow percept and, and there's an awful lot of people who want the conspiracy who want this and they have different kind of uh, motivations some are just people who love conspiracy and as you know, you know me well enough to know I'm, I have a healthy scepticism about many uh, received opinions or, or traditional views. I'm happy to re-examine and challenge, particularly the way the media is owned by so few people. But in the case of Shakespeare, I think that the real conspiracy is that it's more about class than the classics. And there's a desire for it not to be the country boy again he uses loads of imagery a country imagery about falconry about the wren the you know um the the wren goes to uh, uh, die die for lechery thou shalt not die for lechery says Lear. the wren goes to it and the small gilded fly doth lecture in my sight and when cordelia um well i, I should say um, i shouldn't give away things <laughs> in case people haven't read things there's a scene in Lear when he says why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? He cites animals and country life and living and falconry and uh, um, there's a, um, a well-flown bird, he says, about an arrow flying through the air. The clouds are the cloud. The clouds are the target in archery. And there's, the, there's, there's a lot of countryside things. I mean, A.C. Bradley mentioned a load of them and there's a woman as well. I've forgotten her name. Maybe Susan Fellows. So the, the other contenders for authorship would have tended to have been London, educated That's right. and yeah, university boys. Yeah. You know, we're talking people like um, Francis Bacon, um, uh, um, uh, urban intellectual. That's so. right, Marlowe, <laughs> Ben Johnson, um, and the thing about it is that uh, what they have in their work. Uh, uh, and I feel quite confident looking at Marlowe and Shakespeare that there's a difference and it's to be seen I'm doing a book on Macbeth at the moment and I've just suddenly bumped into a whole scene that I don't think Shakespeare wrote and you know that's a weird challenge digging into it I found other people who actually think this was written by Thomas Middleton and I'm happy to have that confirmed because it didn't ring true and, and I'll just share with you very briefly it was that the um um, the, the witches in Shakespeare speak in a very supernatural kind of rhythm it, it's a trochaic tetrameter is the official name so I've found which is this thing of seven 
Um, when shall we three meet again? Seven uh, beats, uh, seven syllables. But this kind of four beats is like when shall we three meet again? Um, and by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Uh, and so the witch is speaking this very strange way. And then suddenly there's this scene where they're speaking in perfect iambic pentameter. And it hasn't got the otherworldliness. There's a kind of odd because it's seven syllables it's odd it feels strange and they are strange and obviously that's why he's done it um so I, i'm okay with the idea that other people have written certain scenes and he certainly had collaborators i know there's a collaborator on pericles as well um so that happens but you can tell there's a difference in the in the writing and the other thing i wanted to say is that with shakespeare as opposed to ben johnson or christopher marlowe um, or edward de vere there's nothing like an aristocratic attitude shakespeare seems to have the same compassion for a beggar as a king um when lear's in his you know lear's a king and he's out in the rain his daughters have shut him out and and he thinks about poor naked wretches out in the rain for the first time in his life and he says something like poor naked wretches you know whithersoever you are how shall you bide the pelting of this pitiless storm how shall your unfed sides your looped and windowed raggedness defend you against something like knights or something as, such as these and he says i've taken too little care of this and it is a growing up there's an uh, so yeah, empathy rather than empathy. A noble condescension absolutely so. that's a great way of saying it um, empathy rather than noble condescension exactly okay so yeah. um, so what so so the idea of your Lear book it's uh, it's massively annotated is this a book that mm. a complete uh, beginner should seek out for Shakespeare is that is that why you've written mm. it? Is, is it a way of uh, is it like an entry into Shakespeare? Because the language is difficult for most for most modern people. Isn't it, it is. It is. Uh, and um, I, I got to know Leah intimately through reading it every year since 1979, when Brendan Catney first introduced it to me. Um, and just be, just by the sheer volume of you know all those hours reading it and thinking about it, I felt that I knew it intimately enough. Um, and I'd be on I'll be honest. I, I um, I'd gone to productions that only frustrated me with you know. So there'd be uh, the the good daughter of the three. I mean, it begins very like a fairy tale. It's a very flimsy premise. There was once a king who had three daughters, and he asked them all to come to his court and say how much they liked him. You know, this is very fairy tale. And the good daughter Cordelia, who won't say anything, she effectively says no comment. What she really, she just uses the word nothing. You know, he asks her what she will say. You know, to she's, not, she's you know. not playing that game. Exactly, she's not playing that game. Now, in most productions of of Leah, they have Cordelia as this meek and mild wallflower, who's so lovely and twee and nice, and and, and it's almost got a soft focus on the lens when she comes on, and you can hear the music telling us what to think about this. Uh, Really, you know, Cordelia is willing to oppose her father in the middle of a whole courtroom scene. She's willing not to give him what he wants. Mm. She's willing to tell her daughters that they're, you know, they're, they're not on. Mm. And, um, and, you know, she's chased and sent away. Mm. This is someone with a lot of guts. And so th when I talk about people uh, playing Shakespeare right, I don't have one right way. And I don't have the Nick Buchanan way. That would be awful. I love to go and see a production surprise me. And one did. Uh, there was the. I, I, I'm not keen on it overall, but the the uh, recent RSC production. Uh, I've forgotten the name. Uh, Simon Russell Beale played Leah. I wasn't happy with his Leah, but the one who played Cordelia uh, at one point came on with a machine gun, and although it was over the top. It actually was closer to Cordelia and her feistiness than this meek and mild wallflower. So I got frustrated with seeing um, uh, there's a locus that uh, as a wide um, uh, gives wide scope to how any character can be interpreted, and I'm happy to be surprised. But it, it's really silly if, when say Hamlet's going to commit contemplating 
his own suicide with to be or not to be. I saw a production where uh, Hamlet was played by a guy who believed Hamlet was bipolar. And this actor's version of bipolarity was to say to be and then giggle and snicker and then say, oh, not to be. And uh, it, it, we lost the gravity of the moment because this is, we should be treated to this guy with a thousand yard stare as he really goes inward and contemplates whether he will or not end his life because of the upset that's around him. Um, so, so I, the, the, I'm happy with the scope, but but I'd, again and again, I'd see performances that cut across the text instead of let the text serve them. And so, I wanted to write a guide that would uh, illumine. I wanted to share it. It's like all things. I think all the good things in in our human life, whether the, it's goodness, truth, or beauty, whatever it is. We, I, I, there's an expansiveness that goes outwards. We want to share. We, want to, yeah. we see a beautiful flower, you know. I come and see this. To use a Philip K. Dick word that he used, mm. it's an exegesis. Yes, indeed. Right? <laughs> Which means strictly, it means an explanation of a sacred text. Is that right? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. So that's your book. That's what your book is. In a sense, in a sense, it is. But I, I is it for I, beginners? It, it, well, it, this is the thing. I'm sorry, I didn't really answer that. It, it, it'll, it'll suit beginners or directors because it's kind of all in there. It'll help beginners to get to know the text. Uh, I, I have to be careful. I always try and avoid using the word explain. Um, because I don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that in the sense that a, 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 yeah. a, a thing of beauty can be experienced perhaps more. So it, it's a walk through. At the beginning, I mentioned how um, I remember going on walks with my father, and he would point things out about things. There would be a bird's nest, and he would say, you know, um, you can hear little chicks there. If you wait, the mother probably come back. And sure enough, the mother did. And 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 so the trees had more in them than once I'd been shown, and the whole of nature was like that. Um, and and um, it wasn't about knowing the name of things; it was about knowing things. And uh, so, with my book on Leah, I don't want to um, just name things, as it were, catalog uh, process. I I want to. Um, uh, shine a light on the wonder that's there and make it available more to to more people because Shakespeare wrote for everyone and that's the whole point is that it's been um, it, it's been appropriated by a certain strata of people who like to go to the theatre with much bling and they don't necessarily get what the play's about but it's become this ticket of status and um, Elite. elitism and to be honest with you I, I deliberately didn't put a bibliography in the back of my book or anything that seemed stuffy in any way uh, and that's deliberate and it may close some doors for me because it may not be regarded uh, with that it, it, it may to them it may lack acumen because it doesn't play the game but I'm not interested in playing the game. I'm interested in op opening the door, you know. Mm. Um, I, think, I think it is. I suspect this is a, more of a time anyway that those barriers are falling away and that, mm. you know, there, there's always people out there who, uh, who are open to wherever they get their information from. And, and uh, the deal, I mean, you've self-published the book and, and so many people are self-publishing now that all those... Um, rigid rules are, mm. are, are falling away anyway yeah. I think you know. I think you're right and I, I also I mean there's another discussion for and something else but I think um, bookshops need to think very carefully about what they're doing and what they're investing in I think I think if we're not careful yeah, you know we lost borders and, and that was a huge book chain we could lose Waterstones if we're not careful but I think they need to get up to speed with what's going on out there. I think they still regard self-publishing as some kind of vanity thing mm. and don't actually look properly yeah. at what's out there because there's some great work yeah. uh, be it, being published mm -hmm. out there. So you've now moved on to Macbeth. Um, Indeed. How many do you, do you feel will be in the series? You've mentioned which which are your favourites again? Yeah, uh, King, Lear. King Lear, Macbeth, Othello, and Hamlet are are my favourites by a long shot. But there's others that I really do uh, admire very deeply. Coriolanus is one of them. 
uh, measure for measure would be another one I think they're right up there and they ask very important questions you know um, f- f- human dilemmas and, and how people approach them uh, I don't know how many there's going to be to be honest with you um, I think after Macbeth I may take a, a little rest because there's other th- I like to write fiction and I want to write some more short stories and see if I can get a short story collection out because I've got a few of them um, but but certainly Leah and then uh, Macbeth I hope to have out um, somewhere near the middle of, of, of 2015 so you know that should be soon I've, I've, I've kind of done most of that um, there's some stuff I'd like to say at the start because I've got a, a, a chapter um, about approaching Shakespeare and that was to do with what we were discussing before and then with authorship and so on no it, sorry no it wasn't to do with authorship uh, uh, I should have explained it. it was to do with um, how, how an actor approaches a text or how a reader approaches a text um, because we talked about percept and concept before and, and if, if the percept is wrong like if somebody approaches say Hamlet uh, assuming he's bipolar then they tend to um, they, they, they tend to uh, create a performance that, that acts only in that direction and doesn't admit the broader scope of what's there. It becomes an argument, doesn't it? It becomes an <laughs> argument, exactly. And I think it, it's very akin to somebody digging a hole in the wrong place, but being really good at digging. And you say, you know, you're fantastic at digging, but it's really a tragedy because they're digging in the wrong place. It's not there, you know. Um, there's a great saying in one of Arthur Kerstler's books about that, about somebody who, who reaches in their pocket on a dark night while they walk home to pull the hanky out and they pull a load of change and the change falls on the floor and uh, then what they do is some a witness on the other side of the road notices they walk 25 yards back to the lamppost and start looking on the floor there and the person who notices goes over to help them and says you, your coins didn't actually drop here they dropped over there and he says uh, I know but the light's much better here you know it's that old stick but the point about it is is that um you know, we can be in the wrong place uh, where the thing isn't, and and if we if we are in that place, we might miss the treasures that are there. And I think the the real premise here is: is the director going to serve Shakespeare, or is Shakespeare going to serve the director? You know, that's the ultimate thing. And I think Shakespeare is probably so big that you, most folks are better off serving him. You know. Place to end, unless you've got anything else to add. No, that's fine. Thank you for the, the opportunity. To